My guest today is one of the most successful pro bodybuilders in history. Lee, welcome to the show. Lee, you've won Mr. Olympia eight times. You were the first to beat Arnold Schwarzenegger's seven-time record. Let's go back in time to the 1990 Olympia. I remember what I was thinking there at that pose down, Lee. I'm gonna beat Lee Haney. You know, you pull a Patrick Mahomes, you slide in front of me. What was going through your head? Man, I'll tell you what, I, I knew that I was fighting for my life, you know what I'm oh. <laughs> Welcome to the Lee Labrada Show. Welcome back, everybody. If I said that my guest today is one of the most successful pro bodybuilders in history, it would be an understatement. He won the IFBB Mr. Olympia eight consecutive times, shattering Arnold Schwarzenegger's seven-time record. And for those of you that are new to bodybuilding, the Mr. Olympia is the Super Bowl of bodybuilding. And this man is the Tom Brady of bodybuilding. Lee Haney is without a doubt the greatest bodybuilder of the 1980s and a living legend. I had the honor of competing with him back in the day, and I can tell you that he is one of the finest men that I've ever met in competition and and in life. Today, we're not only going to talk about Lee, uh, Lee's bodybuilding career, but we're also going to talk about his wisdom and the lessons that you can learn from this man to apply in your own life. Lee, welcome to the show. Thanks, Lee. I, I think you was reading about yourself, wasn't you? Oh, <laughs> you're so funny. <laughs> Thank you for having me as a guest. I oh, really no. appreciate it. Love you and your family. We love you too. So one of the challenges with doing an interview of this type is that we know each other so well uh, that it's easy to assume that our audience uh, knows our common history. Uh, we first met back when we were competing together as pro bodybuilders in the mid 80s. And Lee, you've won Mr. Olympia eight times. You were the first to beat Arnold Schwarzenegger's seven time record. It'd be easy for somebody to look at you and say, well, it couldn't ha it could not have been a struggle for Lee Haney he's so great but getting on top of any sport and staying on top has its own challenges and pressures Lee did the pressure ever get to you well you know one thing as you know Lee when you're on top there's nowhere else to go but down <laughs> so the pressure of, of uh you know how do I stay here what I what can I do different to bring about a better package than the last time. All of those things run through your mind. And uh, if you don't keep it together, man, that can really create a lot of stress. I, I really feel that one of the things that helped me a lot and helped me maintain my sanity was the fact that I had Shirley, my wife was there with me. And then, you know, I, I, I looked at bodybuilding in such a way that it's my job. I didn't worship the craft. You know, although I wanted to be the best at the craft, I didn't work with it. It wasn't the end of the world as the way I looked at it, you know. So I was a husband, then I, I was a father, you know, during my competitive time. I had two kids while I was still competing. And so I guess some people say that was a, a distraction. It could be a distraction, but for me, it helped me maintain my sanity. Got my mind off of how many sets and how many reps time and time again. That's that's a, a tr truly amazing. Uh, and it just uh, speaks loads about you as a man that you're able to be a father and a family man first while you're competing and under these intense pressures to stay on top of a sport at the world level. It's just, it's, it's totally amazing. But as you and I both know, because we have kids, uh, kids are a gift from God and they are just uh, amazing. <laughs> they will humble you. And if you put it in perspective, they will ground you. Lee, would you take a few minutes yeah. to talk about your story, how you got into bodybuilding and competing? Well, you know, when I was uh, nine, 10 years old, I always fantasized of maybe growing up one day to be be Hercules or Samson. And then uh, I recall at an early age, me and my parents would go to the grocery stores and first thing I would do would run to the newsstand to check out the magazine. <laughs> and it was there that I saw pictures of people like Arnold and Robbie Robinson and the other bodybuilding legends. And I wanted to be like these guys. And so that's sort of where I cut my teeth and I asked my parents for a set of weights when I was around, set of weights when I was around 11 years old. 
And they got them for me for Christmas. And next thing you know, man, with it came that the Charles Atlas course. And I would read and study as much as I could and, and read the magazines about nutrition. And I started putting little plans together based upon what I read. And that's where the, the joy of bodybuilding started to grow or the fire started to grow. You were seeing changes in your body even at that young age, weren't you? Yes, even at a young age, you know, I, uh, you know, my arms were so skinny, I was embarrassed to wear short sleeve shirts. So, I can't, you know, I, can't. I started doing my curls and the push ups and, you know, all of those kinds of things. I saw the body start to change. And by the age, by the age of 16 years old, I was ready to. Jump into my first uh, bodybuilding competition, which I did. And uh, I didn't place, but I had a great time. And I was told by a lot of the judges that had great potential. I say you so did. So it was from there that I said, <laughs> okay. Yeah, boy, I'll, I'll tell you what, uh, I can't imagine being Lee Haney and being afraid to show off my arms, number one. And number two, those judges were right when they said you had great potential. <laughs> so from there, from that first contest, uh, wh where, where, did, where did you go next? Well, I continued to train and I got in, involved in other sports like, uh, you know, track and field, uh, football, and I knew that weight training would make me better at those particular sports, but that also made me look good too, because I wanted to be cute for the girls, you know, so right, right. that was another big <laughs> thing about it. But <laughs> so then by the time I hit um, 18, I was competing in other shows like the Mr. Palmetto, the Mr. South, and ended up beating guys who was 30 and 40 years old. So that said to me that, well, maybe you, you got, got what it take in this kind of a deal. Uh, then at the age of 19, I entered the Teenage American, Detroit, Michigan, 1979, and won that show, beating over 100 teenagers across the United States. And that said to me, so, well, listen, some of the greatest of bodybuilding legends also won the Teenage America. That's right. So maybe I'm on to something here. That That's right. You were starting to realize that uh, that you had what it took in beating out a, a hundred of the top teenagers in the country. Well, I'd say that that at that point that you you were arriving now. Lee, you went on to uh, win, was it the Junior America? Yeah, it was the first NPC Junior Nationals. Uh, 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 I don't know. I know in 1982, the NPC started. So I, I could have been the first NPC Junior National Champion I'm not sure if it was the NPC or the AAU. Right. But, but I, I believe it was the NPC, but I won it. Then a few months later, I ended the NPC Nationals in 1982 and won that show also. That's right. And then you were on to your pro card. Did you compete in the IFBB Mr. Universe? It was the IFBB World Championship. Okay. Which took place in Belgium. Uh, it was there that uh, I met, you know, athletes from all over the world. That was a very exciting time for me, you know, coming from where I did. And here you go in Belgium and Europe competing against guys like Gunnar Rosebo, Ralph Newman, just to name a few of them. And we had a fantastic time. As a matter of fact, the American team, which was James Gobert, Moses Maldonado, uh, Dale Rupplinger and myself, all of us was part of the American team. And at the end of the night, all of us had won our places uh, in the IFBB World Championship, except for Moses. He, I think he placed second. But uh, I was crowned the heavyweight world champion there. That that was an amazing, an amazing year and an amazing accomplishment. But I know that you didn't stop there. I know that you entered the pro ranks and you won the uh, the IFBB Night of the Champions. And I know that you won a number of Grand Prix. And then in 1984, was that your first Mr. Olympia or did you enter that in 1983? Well, my first one was, was in 1983 and in, in Germany where I placed third. Right. And Samir Banut won that one. I think Muhammad Bakawi placed second and I placed third. That's right. And then in 1984 rolls around and you are competing in New York City. And I will tell you that I was there and I was backstage with my then brother-in-law Samir, Samir Banut, and I was an amateur. And I remember seeing you win that competition. You were competing with the likes of the legend Sergio Oliva. And I, I can only imagine, uh, you know, when, when, uh, cause this happened to me too, when I entered my, uh, uh, the, the Olympia years, 
some of, uh, competing with some of those past champions was just so humbling. Yes, it, it sure was. I mean, there I'm on the stage with the legend Sergio Olivier, and then Robbie Robertson and Roy Callender, and and then you had uh, Sam- Samir Benut, the, the the presence Mr. Olympia. Then you had, um, I mean, uh, I think Boya Cole was there. It was it was just an amazing deal. Uh, you just being there and. Uh, so it, it was just mind blowing to be there on the same stage with those legends was was absolutely incredible. And I was really fortunate to be a part of the tail end of that. A lot of guys can't say that, but I can. And it was such a privilege. And people say, well, Lee, you be sure. To- no, no, no. I, you cannot be the myth. You cannot be the legend. And he was uh, a legend. You know, I was just honored to be there. Whatever happened, happened. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, I I, uh, I I have the same level of respect for him and and all of the greats that I stood uh, uh, next to, including yourself. You know, it, it wasn't uh, it wasn't about bringing home the trophy. It was about the path of the champion and just being on that hallowed ground called the Mr. Olympia stage. You know, it was just uh, such an, an amazing, an amazing uh, experience. So, so Lee, by the time that you win this Mr. Olympia about three times, what are you, what are you starting to think about at that point? Are you, are you saying, I'm going to win this X number of times, or what's going through your head at that time? Well, you know, initially, uh, Lee, I at first said, I said, well, you know, if I could win the Olympia three times, that'd be great. You know, but, uh, but man, three came around so fast. <laughs> yes, it and did. when I got to three, I said, well, maybe, maybe I can do five, you know? <laughs> Maybe you could do and the five. The fifth one came around so fast. Yeah, yeah. I'm telling you, man, it was just boom, boom, boom. The years go by so quick. Yeah. So then when I got to seven, I said, well, then I said, well, maybe I can do seven. And it came fast. Once I got to seven, I thought to myself, well, you know, seven is a record. You know, all of them didn't do seven in a row, you know, but he did do overall seven. So maybe, you know. And I had a conversation with Shirley, you know, and, you know, as you do, Shirley was a, well, the athlete. We, you know, I've known her since the second grade. So we came through school together and I sit down and had a conversation with her about it. I said, well, baby, what do you think? Seven is a record in itself. You know, maybe I should quit here. And, and she says to me, uh, what are you talking about? Quit. She said, no, you got to do it. What's the matter with you? You know, so. So, so the athlete <laughs> surely came out, which was somewhat embarrassing to me that no. I was even, you know, think of just stopping that seven. So I, I had to push on if I want to still stay on her good side. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, you had to push on and, and you and you got your eighth win, breaking Arnold's record. Now, I, I got a question for you. And uh, and that is you get to the eighth win. And you're saying, okay, I've broken Arnold's record. Well, at that point, you decide to retire at the top of your game. And uh, uh, in, in, I think that was 1991. And uh, nobody could come yeah. close to you at that show. You destroyed everybody. You're at the top of the game. Why not go on to number nine or make it an even 10? Well, you know, Lee, it's like when I hit the, the, the uh, eighth one, it was like I was able to exhale. You know, like, whew. not that I was in fear of what will come next. It's just, it's like, I just feel in my heart that I have achieved what I wanted to, wanted to accomplish. And Thank it was time to use that faith and what I had accomplished in other areas. You know, I was looking forward to, okay, what, what, what else is out there? You know, cause you can only stay for so long in a particular area, you know, who else am I beyond just this? You know, right. I enjoyed being a father. I was looking forward to uh, t-ball games with my son. That's right. You know, and little football games. So all of those things that I had to look forward to and live for was exciting to me. And I was looking forward to stepping over to that to the next um, uh, part of my journey. You know, so I, I never regretted having not competed again. As a matter of fact, I never gave it another thought. I remember me and Dory <laughs> were, I saw Dory in Atlanta and we were sitting, you know, Chad in a casual conversation. He said, Lee, uh, uh, what do you think about us going going at it again? 
I said, man, you lost your mind. I'm going fishing. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Yes, yeah. Once, once, uh, once you have gone through that chapter, you're ready to go on to something else, and certainly you accomplish so much, like climbing Mount Everest, you know, and and you know, and then you're ready to go on and and uh, have time with your family and turn the chapter, uh, go on to the next chapter in the life of of Lee Haney. You know, I've recently had someone ask me, you know, hey, they're bringing the Masters Olympia back, and and uh, and and you sh you should you should come back, you should compete. And I go, do I look like I have a hole in my head? You you know, it's, it's, it's like, no, nah, been, been there, done it, enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, but I have, I have moved on to other parts of my life with my family, uh, my business and the like. But Lee, before we get off bodybuilding, because I, I want to ask you about so many, so many more things. Uh, you're, you're such a well-rounded person. My son Hunter gave me a present for Christmas. He was just so excited. He had it all wrapped up. He goes, dad, open this up. And it's, it's, it's something that was framed, you know, it was about two by three. And I go, it's gotta be a poster of some kind. So I open it up and it was a poster from the 1990 Mr. Olympia in Chicago. And uh, he had gotten that poster from a friend of his at the gym and he was just so proud to give it to me, you know? And, uh, and so there's something that I've always wanted to ask you. So Let's go back in time to the 1990 Olympia. We're coming out of the prejudging, and I find out that I'm just a little bit ahead of you, okay? But being the <laughs> champ that you are, you know, you pull a Patrick Mahomes and you slide in front of me and you pull off that big win. I remember what I was thinking there at that post down, Lee, and I was thinking to myself, I'm gonna beat Lee Haney. Boy, was I wrong. So I was just, I want to ask you if you remember what was going through your head. Man, I'll tell you what, I, I knew that I was fighting for my life. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> and I knew that you had always been chopping at my heels for the longest. And, but, you know, one thing I didn't never was in fear of, Lee, was that who won or who lost. I, I never worried about, I, I was never, I never felt that way about any of the competitions because I've always maintained the, uh, uh, the mind thought that, okay, we're, we're working. And as we work hard, if we work hard enough and we come up with the right package, we get a bonus. That's a nice check. Right. However, it's not the end of the world. I never worshiped bodybuilding. I never worshiped the sport. So I was going to shake hands with, you are rich or whomever, my Christian, whoever won. I never internalized. Uh, it's got to be me to win. I, I never did. I never lost sleep what, about any what, of that. Never. 100%. In my whole career. 100%. I can totally, totally agree with you on that, Lee. You know, in fact, I had that same conversation with my son Hunter the other day, and I, and I told him, you know, bodybuilding is an intrinsic reward in and of itself. It is, it's, that, it's that journey. You know, too often people are looking for the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, Okay, and they miss the fact that the rainbow is the pot of gold. It's that journey that that you get the the uh, the personal growth from and the satisfaction, and and it's a battle against yourself, improving yourself from from year to year. The extrinsic reward is if that panel of judges agrees and hands you a trophy, but that is not ultimately what we do it for. It's it's for the, the love of bodybuilding and improving from year to year and, and delivering the best package that we can, as you say. Exactly. And Lee, I, I, what I've got from bodybuilding that was so beautiful and my wife's, we sit, we talk about it all the time, is a relationship and friends like yourself over the years, Rich and Mike Christian and all of us guys, you know, Vince Taylor, we're still alive and we're still healthy. And while we were competing, we jabbed at each other. <laughs> we, we made jokes, but man, it was in the spirit of, of, of good sportsmanship. Yes. And what's most important, I, I always had in, in, in my mindset, after I won the first Olympia, I wrote my first book. I wrote the book myself, my book called Totally Awesome. And those of you listening, you can go to LeeHaney.com. You can get it digital. I just sold out of the last copies, but I was thinking ahead of time, how can I economize this hard work and this dedication? 
So it's more than just getting a trophy in my mind, even back then. My dad asked me when I'd say, okay, dad, I don't want to play college football, but if I got to get my education doing this, then I'll do it. But if there's a way for me to still get my education and, and get more into the bodybuilding, I want to do it. My dad asked me, he said, well, son, can you make a living doing that? That was his number one, can you make a living? And so I've kept that in mind all the years. So when I won my first Olympia, man, I was already writing my first book. Oh, yeah. And then beyond that, I cr- I came up with a a, uh, a supplement uh, that goes, a natural antibiotic supplement that you spray under the tongue. So I was working on economizing this hard work. When I won my first Mr. Olympia uh, even before I won the Mr. Olympia doing guest appearances, I started buying up real estate even before I won the Mr. Olympia. That's so, man, that- I'm already thinking about, okay, how can I economize this? Because guess what? I had a wife. I knew I wanted to have kids. And you got you to gotta have diaper money, man. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you got to have education. You got to have a retirement plan. Have you you got to have a plan. That's right. And have you seen the price of baby formula and diapers lately? <laughs> Oh, man. I, I have to make a comeback. Maybe I'll be in the master oh, living man, for my tell- grandkids now. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it is just, uh, it's a crazy, but you know what, one of the things that I really admire about you, Lee, is how you're so well balanced and you've always had your priorities in life. You know, and, and speaking of life, you know, a lot of our viewers, they have life challenges and you know, those can take different forms. They're not bodybuilding contests, but they're just everyday challenges. You know, I wanted to ask you, what do you do to overcome setbacks and, and not, not in bodybuilding contests, but just in life in general, what's your view on that? Well, you know, Lee, I spend my morning, time I get up in the morning, I'm on my knees praying. I'm asking for God's wisdom to guide me, to lead me, to give me instruction, you know, and I, I believe his word. You know, I, I became a follower of Jesus Christ when I was nine years old and I knew how much he loved me, which is the reason why I accepted, accepted him as Lord and Savior of my life. So knowing how much he loved me and how much he cared for me and he proved that love. I'm covered by him. So I've never worried about if you do have a challenge or whatever it is. I don't have to walk by myself in those challenges. I've always known that God would be with me. He would protect me. He would provide for me. And if sometimes the road got tough or tougher in those challenges, that he was right there beside me because I'm not going to wish away the challenge. I'm going to say, well, and I've said, said, Lord, I'm going to see what you're going to do about this deal. I know that you're with me. I mean, but come hell or high water, I know you still got me and I still got you. So here we go. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that's the way I've always had. That's been my attitude then. And that's what it is now. That's 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 a, a, a great mindset. Lee, you're a Christian and so am I. Our viewers come from diverse backgrounds and their beliefs. But if we can talk about our faith, Christianity, I believe, is misunderstood. A lot of people think it's legalistic and judgmental. But you and I both know that the teaching of Jesus Christ is rooted in love. Love your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as you love yourself. The message of Jesus Christ is come as you are. I love you. And a lot of people misunderstand that. You know, so let's discuss our faith for, for a moment. I know that you're a man of God. I know that you've been a Christian since uh, that you, you were nine years old. You know, we spend time developing our physical power. We uh, spend time developing, you know, our our mental power, strengthening our mind. But how do we strengthen our spirits? You know, as as a viewer, what would you tell our viewers about spiritual strength? Well, you know, as you just said, Lee, once you understand the, you know, what Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, did on the cross, how God gave his only begotten son, it was all about love. It was all about listening, hearing, making ourselves available, you know, and and so it's very simple. It's not complicated. You know, it's not, he made it uncomplicated. It's just man makes it complicated. All that the Lord asks for is a relationship and fellowship. You are my Lord. You are my savior. And Lord, I want to hang out with you. He want to hang out with us. When you hang out with the Lord and reading his word and praying and asking him to guide you into to reveal to you the revelation of his love, which is huge, then it eases your mind, it eases your heart. 
So it's no perfection and it's not a legalistic thing that people are looking for. You know, where you got to jump up and down three times and he'll hear you or you got to shout and yell. No, no, no. He hears you in your most subtle voice. And once you get an understanding of that, like, for instance, I was walking out the other day and I'm looking at worms all over the ground. OK, now birds eat worms, right? <laughs> right. So so <laughs> if the Lord prepared a meal for the birds, then. Of course, he's going to prepare a meal for me and for us, his children, you know, so it, it's as simple as that. But people make it complicated, you know, so he'll provide for your need. But there's things. He, he has an open, uh, open invitation for those who want to receive. He's not going to twist your arm and say, listen to me, uh, accept my love. It's an invitation openly for you to receive and accept it for yourself. And once you do that, and once you start to read and learn more about what he did, he healed the sick, he helped the lame walk, he gave sight to the blind. He loved people into, into uh, uh, his, his, his house. And that's why people accepted him. He was always cool. He was never complicated. He hung around with people that was, let's see, most folks look at like outcasts. They always right. wanted to hear what he had to say. Because he broke it down in a nice, comfortable, easy way. He made them feel good. He loved them into the kingdom. He didn't beat them down or curse them or spit at them or treat them in the wrong way. So that's what the world is sort of messed up in, you know? So it's, it's, it's as simple as that. That That is very, very well put, Lee. Now, Lee, do you have a ministry. I know you've worked a lot with, with young people, with the youth. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, Heinous Harvest House is a nonprofit organization that we started, whoa, well, man, way back in, I think, 1996, 94. And I'll tell you how it started. <laughs> Me and one of my buddies, you know, we had a, we was working with the 10 year old football team, right? So we were the coaches. And my son was on the team. Man, we got our butt kicked. We never won a game. <laughs> but <laughs> what was happening, we were, get tennis shoes for the little boys. We would hang out with them, get them food. And after the season was over, I said, man, you know what? Let's, let's continue doing this. So we started a mentoring program called Haynes Harvest House. And so one mother would tell another mother, another mother would tell that mother. And all of a sudden we got all these young boys and a lot of them didn't have fathers present in their homes. So we started to be sort of gap men or gap fathers for these young men. And that's how Harvest House started. And then we had, uh, I went to an auction to help a ministry who was bidding for property. And so I was already looking for land to do something like that, to create a form of nature, sort of a nature retreat center. And so I remember driving along one day and I said, well, Lord, you said in your word, you would give me the desires of, of my heart. And that's found in uh, Psalms 37 chapter. What he said, if you honor me, I will give you the desires of your heart. I said, well, Lord, my desire is to be a blessing in this community, to give these kids and families something beautiful to see, the beauty of your creation. And I'm riding along and I'm looking. And I said, well, Lord, you know what? I'm not going to look anymore. I'm going home. I went home. And here I am a few months later at an auction to help another ministry. I never met him before when our friends told us about it. So we were there. They ended up getting... 15 acres and a uh, and a beautiful facility for 105,000. And it went to 105,000 at an auction. And the pastor couldn't go more than 100,000. So me and Shirley said, say 105. So he went to 105, he got it. Then they said, oh, by the way, we auctioned off some other properties. And here I am, I said, okay. I looked to heaven, I said, Lord, it's in your hands. Because I had been looking for a place but I was also building my gyms downtown in the city at the same time. So I'm already writing checks. Next thing you know, auction start. One guy say 10, another guy say 20. I say 30, another guy say 40. I don't, anyway, I ended up getting 40 acres for $65,000. Wow. <laughs> and mind you, this was right, right down from the Atlanta airport. So... $65,000. And the people who bid it against me, they came up and said... We called Wendy. You were trying to do a retreat center for kids. He said, if we knew that, we would have never said anything. 
I don't know how they heard about it, but they heard about it. But anyway, I'm thinking this is just land. That's all. So I'm looking at this plaque with the land map on it, and I go out, and lo and behold, we go deep into the forest, and didn't know it was a road going to the place, and here's a house, brick house, kitchen big enough to seat 80 people. Oh my gosh. Horse stables connected to the, to the, to the house, four horse stalls, barn, kennel, the whole deal. I found out it was a a, a ranch for horses, Tennessee, Tennessee walking horses uh, was reared there. And I ended up getting all of that for $65,000. That's amazing. Which I later found out it appraised for $1.5 million. Oh my gosh. But it just goes to show when your heart is in the right place and you honor God, he will give you the desire of your heart. If your desires is in the right place. And so we were blessed to get that and we used to bless the community. We started the mentoring programs there. We had a basketball court, full basketball court. We had a baseball field. We had a hallelujah trail. We had pop billy pigs, chickens, rabbits, horses, goats, name it. <laughs> name it. We had it. <laughs> Summer camps for kids, the whole deal, man. It was just absolutely incredible just seeing how God's work because I know he loved me. He loved his children. And if we stand on his word, he'll do great and mighty things, things beyond our mental comprehension. So I've witnessed and I've seen that time and time again. You know, amidst trials, I've seen him still come forth and bless. So, that, hey, uh, that's why I, I lost my mind to the world and yeah. I gave it, I, I found it in Christ. God is good, brother. So let me ask you this. What is God calling you to do now? What, what is your mission today, Lee? Well, you know what? My mission today is when I started the International Association of Fitness Science, right? I wanted to teach uh, people who want to become personal trainers the right way to train. You know, not only teach them to be good trainers, but to give them the, the, the tools of character to be good people, too. You know, understanding that you have opportunity to serve and not to be self-serving. I mean, if you're in that, if you're in this just for money, then you then you don't I don't want you to be a part of the IFX. You know, our motto is create an exercise and fitness model that can be used to impact people and communities everywhere. So that's what we set out to do. So that's that's the main thing as far as that is concerned, teaching health, fitness, wellness. Then the other thing that I'm doing, too, I do a lot of men ministry, whereby I sow seeds in the lives of men so that they'll have a clear understanding of what authentic manhood is supposed to look like as God has called men to, to be and to act, to honor their families, to love their wives, to raise their children up in the way that they should go, to also be gatekeepers in their communities. All that is important. And that's what God is, that's what he set in place for every man. It's just a lot of us haven't gotten to that point and don't have the understanding. But that's why they got people like myself and you. Your example of family is one of those things. My example of family. That's the first mission that he called man to. That's why he said, it's not meant for man to be alone. I will make him a help me, which is a wife. And so it's power in having the right wife because she is the counsel that we need to live out the mission that God has called us to. So all of those things, man, are, are important. And those are the things that I love, you know, and now it's sun season, a new generation. I'm looking forward to the honor coming up in the next few weeks which I can get up there and sow some seeds in the lives of some of the other young athletes coming along. But it's all about impacting and influencing. Absolutely. And, and influencing people is something that you're doing, Lee, in a most profound way. You know, it's very, very admirable. What is your advice for, uh, I'm just going to shift back to, uh, to uh, bodybuilding for a quick second. What's your advice for upcoming young bodybuilders, uh, you know, young people that want to enter and participate in bodybuilding? Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, make sure you, you, you have a well-established foundation. Get the proper foundation first. You know, when it comes to training, come to nutrition. You know, don't believe everything you hear or see. 
on Instagram or Facebook. You really, and I really stress upon uh, young athletes, go to a level of knowledge of having been there, done that. So if you call upon the Lee Labrada, he's been there, done that. You call upon a Rich Gaspar, you call upon a Mike Chris, a Chris Cremier. You've got people who've been there, done that. You know, Charles Glass, who have an understanding of how things work as far as our body is concerned and nutrition, because the proof is in the pudding. We're still healthy. We're still alive. We're not dying, and we did not die prematurely from doing the wrong things. Right. You know, myself and Linda Murray spoke a few weeks ago at a uh, NPC regional event here in Georgia, and our whole conversation was about competing healthy. And during that time, I had uh, uh, some athletes say, well, okay, what source do we go to to learn that? I said, well, guess what? I want you to go to the IAFS certification.com link. That's a certification program that I created. And Lee, what I have in my program is what you already know. It's what Rich Gasparri already know. I just put together a certification program. We learn from the grades of legends. And all of those legends live long, healthy lives. It was about the health. It wasn't about the biggest guy. You know, and I really feel bodybuilding need to retro back to what it was intended to be, whereby a guy at your height, your weight could still knock out a giant like me at my height and my weight. It didn't make a difference about your weight size during that era. A cowboy spanked my butt all across Europe at five foot two, 152 pounds. So and that kept bodybuilding in line as it should have never gone away from. Right. I, I, I would uh, wholeheartedly agree. Lee, one more time. How does someone get in touch with you for more information on the International Association of Fitness Science? Well, Lee, they can go to my website, LeeHaney.com, and there's a link that can take them to the certification site, which is certification.com. So they can get there uh, either way. And we have, I offer three different certifications. One is ultimate bodybuilding. That's what we do. That covers training system, training philosophy. It also talks about carb loading, carb depleting, everything you need to know. It also talks about last minute prep that doesn't lead athletes to discontinue drinking water, which is totally ignorant, total ignorance. Never had to do that. Uh, then we also have another one, which is functional training, which is geared more toward the general public. Okay. Then we have one additional one that was called the Ministry of Fitness, which is designed for people who want to teach health and fitness within their, whether it's a church or synagogue, whatever their religious institution is. Okay, that's that's very helpful because I was going to ask you if IAFS was just for bodybuilders and personal trainers, but you answered that question. There's something there for everybody, including people that just are interested in general fitness or how do I start getting in shape? So they, they have uh, that information there as well. Yes, yes. And Lee, we got it set up where you can actually, you get downloads of video training tips, all of that. You get a copy of my book, uh, Totally Fit. You get a copy of my book, Fit at Any Age, which I'm having it here. This is more geared towards functional training. That's what Lee, the general Lee, population Lee, Scooch that book over just a little bit. I, I want everybody to see that. Fit at any age. And, and can can they get that on Amazon or do they buy it directly off LeeHaney.com? Well, they can get it at Amazon. Or they can go to LeeHaney.com and get a digital. Or I can send them an autographed copy of it. So oh, they, man, they have I, a truck. We'll have get the autographed copy. Home this weekend too. I would get the autographed copy. <laughs> That's what I would get. <laughs> yes, sir. I put that in a place of honor. Lee, this was great today. I, I mean, I just want to thank you. Uh, it's just such an honor to have you here uh, with with me. And I just want to thank you for joining me and sharing your wisdom and 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 uh, your witness with uh, all of our viewers. And guys, help us to grow the Lee Labrada Show by sharing this show, the Lee Haney episode, with at least one of your friends. And make sure that you hit the subscribe all button and ring the bell. That's the subscribe all button, and that way you won't miss any of the upcoming episodes. And as as uh, I like to say, stay motivated, get up, and look up. God bless you. The Lee Labrada Show. 
thunder from a distant shore. Voices in my head.